Recent studies have noticed that two forces are at work within global religious movements. There's a universalizing force and a particularizing force, um, which means, in other words, religions have to have some degree of universal attraction or else they don't spread. But at the same time, the experience or meaning of the religion can't be too universal or they become banal. For example, be nice is a creed that nearly everyone could agree with, but no one will go in any trouble to make or maintain a religion of be nicism. So my view on the relationship between global Mormonism and the forces of colonialism is shaped by my work on native Chinese religion and global Christian history. And in histories of global his, um, Christianity in the 1970s and 1980s, theories of cultural imperialism and colonization of consciousness came to the forefront. More recently, a new wave of mission historiography has emerged that corrects hagiographic depictions of missionary work and also challenges the imperialist interpretations as limited in the extent that they oversimplify complex cultural exchanges and ignore the agency of native Chinese Christians, reducing a complex set of interactions to a dichotomy between actor and acted upon. So to be clear, um, we have to acknowledge the often significant imbalances of political and economic power and the often hegemonic cultural aims that have frequently characterized the interaction between Christian missionaries and native peoples, including Mormon missionaries and native peoples. At the same time, we can't ignore other dynamics at play, particularly native converts demonstrated agency to embrace, redefine, reproduce, and to translate the gospel into their own social and spiritual realities for the fulfillment of their own goals. So um, let's ask some other questions. Um, as we think about this relationship between um, you know, global religion, not just Mormonism, but you know, other religions that have a kind of global presence, um, we think about this tension between um, universal culture, homogeneity, and uh, fragmentation or heterogeneity. And um, it makes us think about what Mormonism has to contribute to this discussion. I mean, studies, people who study global religion acknowledge that these two processes are, you know, both coexist, but what, what else can we understand about how they're actually working and interacting? So um, anthropologists talk about the generative tension between homogeneity and heterogeneity, um, and how, but we, we the, there's not that much that people say besides, um, you know, we see both of these processes at work. So I'm trying to explore how these two processes interact, and we can use Mormonism as an example. Um, and to put that question in another way, the question is, how do successful global religious movements spread out while still holding together, um, while remaining fast in one place and, and not losing their distinctiveness or their ability to be relatable to people in a certain place? So um, one example of too much spread would be um, like yoga, you know, originally a religious practice but now it's ubiquitous and, and monetized and commercialized. It's everywhere, right? Um, too much holding together. Um, for example, Chinese territorial cults, you know, the, the local god of a village in this place. N no one here worships that god. So let's look about Mormonism. Um, look at Mormonism. My father-in-law, um, then serving as president of the Seattle stake, once said to me, the church may or may not be true but it is organized. And institution building is in Mormonism's DNA. A local Mormon congregation is indefinitely under construction, and local Mormon congregants are indefinitely under conscription, as many of you um, who are LDS know. So um, practicing Mormons are engaged in a collective, organized spiritual life. And being Mormon is not just a matter of adhering to a set of doctrines or performing a set of rituals. Um, as it is about functioning within the Mormon community. So in understanding Mormonism, it's not enough to simply shoulder the twin buckets of doctrines and practices. We also have to examine um, the institutional structure is manifest in formal and informal institutions. And I've tried to think about this here. You know, doctrines are these kind of what people believe, practices are what people do, but how do we talk about what people do together or the relationships between people or the patterns of collectivity? That, um, that shape these congregations. So I'd like to um, just, I, I'd like to, for the sake of this discussion, I've, I've, um, I'd like to talk about institutions, um, by which I mean organizational, organizational structures, patterns, modes, tools, 
um, shared preferences, traditions, personalities, this question of what are the people doing amongst themselves and how do they believe and act as a collective. So um, I define institutions as permanent or semi-permanent organizational structures within a local congregation that actively channel and direct the flow of a congregation's collective life. So one example might, um, a metaphor for, for example, might be the ruts through which church members' carts travel as they trundle to and fro between meetings, classes, activities, and social interactions. Like the earth and rain and drought, these ruts are changeable under some conditions and set and rigid under other conditions, able to guide certain forms of mandated or formal and spontaneous or informal group activity. So institutions, uh, in, in my definition, can include official organizational structures, um, local traditions or mores, and even individuals um, whose strong personalities exercise significant influence within a congregation. So for example, in my um, home ward of Costa Mesa, California, I can think of you know, half a dozen individuals who, um, whose influence, distinctive influence on the culture of the ward over the course of several um, decades could qualify them as institutions. And actually, we have this saying in English, right? Like, she's an institution. Patrick Mason is an institution. Um, so informal institutions, therefore, are those institutions that aren't explicitly determined or spelled out through official church policy. Um, they're discretionary, contingent, and informal modes of Mormon collectivity. So I want to make a distinction between um, institutions, as I'm talking about them, and culture and practice. Um, I'm using the term informal institutions instead of culture, because culture is so nebulous. It's so um, big. Informal institutions are an important part of culture, but they're more elemental and discreet. And, and similarly, I'm using the term informal institutions to analyze practice at a more detailed and specific level. Um, so for example, um, let's take the Mormon sacrament ritual. That's a practice shaped by formal and informal institutions. Um, the formal institutions within the sacrament rite include you know, the text, the liturgy of the prayer. Um, they must be certified by the bishop or the branch president. Um, and informal aspects are um, things like how are the words and phrases of the prayer vocally articulated um, by the person, who, the priest who's giving the blessing. Um, if a ner nervous teenager reading the prayer makes a, a mistake, maybe makes a mistake multiple times. How many times does the branch president or the bishop make this person say it over and over and over again? Do they get off with a free pass? That's, um, you know, not, that's kind of within the bishop's discretionary personal power. So um, both institutions, in that case, the bishop's formal authority and then the bishop's informal personal influence um, help to shape the practice of the sacrament rite. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this kind of specific um, uh, level of interaction between members of the congregation that, is, that, are, that are kind of permanent or semi-permanent and set in patterns. So um, now we can use the sacrament rite example to see that informal institutions can sometimes be more rigid and institutional than formal institutions. So for example, in one of my former LDS um, congregations in Auckland, the dress code for deacons and teachers passing the sacrament was a black coat, a tie, a white shirt, and either black pants or a black lava lava, lava, lava or tupenu, um, like the Samoan or Tongan um, dress. So these precise spe specifications you know, weren't set out in the official handbook for instructions, but they adherence to this code carried a sense of conspicuous moral force within this particular congregation. So formal institutions um, within Mormonism comprise the hierarchical uh, priesthood chain of authority, whose links include you know, the church leadership positions, um, the top leadership in Salt Lake City, the vast bureaucratic apparatus that manages the general handbook of instructions, curriculum, periodicals, corporate property, public affairs, all of that is um, part of Mormonism's formal institutional structure. But informal institutions exist at or below the stake level, including particular forms of implementation of official church programs that are unique to a given local unit. So in this sense, men or women within these units can, can in themselves be informal institutions. And other examples of informal institutions include, for example, how does the elders quorum sing hymns? Um, what activities are there for the annual ward party? Um, how do people choose speakers for district conference? Um, they also include media produced by church members, 
um, and people who are not employed or sponsored by the church, um, they might ha not have a formally declared structure or be officially sanctioned in their every detail, but they're part of the structure of the local congregation. And they carry significant weight in shaping choices made by local members, including leaders, that create the collective life of the congregation. Around the world, Mormonism's formal and inf informal institutions interlock, overlap, and blur. Um, informal institutions always nearly link to a formal institution. So for example, um, in one Seattle ward, um, one bishop only mandated the only music in sacrament meeting would be from the Green Hymn Book. If it wasn't in the Green Hymn Book, it could not you know, be sent into, the sp into space. Um, and all, all verses in every single hymn must always be sung. This was this bishop's thing. Um, and yet even after that bishop um, was released and ceased to be formally linked to that church administration, i.e. released from his calling, this particular influence on the ward's musical culture um, was, has been perpetuated by his direct successor and other ward members generally. So in that sense, the informal institutions are more lasting and permanent than the formal institutions. So um, crucially, ties between formal and informal institutions do not necessarily create a global culture that is uniform or homogenous from top to bottom. On, con on the contrary, in local Mormon informal institutions, the link to formal authority functions not as a conduit for sameness, but as the justification or impetus for highly particularistic informal institutions. At times, as in the case of the original Mormon restorationist projects, emulation of primitive Christianity as, as those people understood it, the most original local innovations are produced out of a straightforward desire to adhere with absolute fidelity to central directives. Hence, Mormonism's centralized structure does not merely control and constrain, but also legitimates, legitimates and enables local innovation. So um, as a way to kind of talk about how this is working, I. Um, Look at the primary presentation. Okay, this is you know, known as the sacrament meeting program or the primary program. It's both a formal and an informal Mormon institution. On the one hand, um, the official prescription for the content is set out in an annual outline for sharing time. And they rotate in a five-yearly cycle. So it goes, I know my Savior lives. I know the scriptures are true. Choose the right. Uh, I am a child of God. Families are forever. And then I know my Savior lives. I know the scriptures are true. Choose the right. I am a child of God. So um, very you know, standardized. Um, and the differences implied between each of these yearly themes are actually minimized, as because each month works through a list of stock subtopics, like the life of Christ, um, prophets, commandments, the restoration through Joseph Smith, and so on. Um, in each outline, there's you know, a specific um, directions for lessons every single Sunday of the entire year. Uh, you know, the attention activities, the points for discussion, visual aids, everything. Okay, and then all of this comes together every year in the primary presentation, the day and sacrament meeting when the primary is in charge of the entire content of the meeting. And this outline is translated at church headquarters into 37 languages, it's distributed worldwide. Um, and so from this point of view, the primary presentation is a formal institution. It's a highly centralized, vertically correlated, content controlled performance that directly transmit the perspectives of Mormon administrators in Salt Lake City. Now, at the same time, the primary presentation is also highly idiosyncratic, extremely local. Um, it involves singing, public speaking, young children, and individ individual primary leaders who feel personally responsible for the success of the pr presentation in a doctrinal, pastoral, and performative sense. And it varies from country to country, from unit to unit, and is part of how the congregation sees itself as a whole. So, very quickly, um, I'll, you know, I'm, this is like a 50-page paper, but I'm trying to I'll just talk about these three different primary presentations, um, which occurred within the space of a year, um, in which it, which I participated as a participant observer. So um, there's the Hong Kong International Branches presentation, November 2013. The Hong Kong Mandarin Branches presentation. Notice they're about three months behind the international branch. And then the Auckland Ward um, in 2014. These are not official names. These are just kind of nicknames for these units. Um, very quickly, uh, the international branch has got 150 expatriate children, uh, mostly American, but also from the UK and other Asian countries. Most of them go to private international schools, have um, live-in nannies who live in their homes. Um, they have really busy extracurricular schedules. And um, the president at the time was a uh, bright, um, vibrant woman who had gotten a master's degree from USC. Um, 
the Hong Kong Mandarin branch at the time had between two and 20 children, depending on who showed up. Um, they were the children of mainland Chinese and Taiwanese in Hong Kong, um, attending public and private schools. And the president was this um, a BYU graduate who spoke all these different languages. Um, she was Japanese, but she also spoke Mandarin. And um, the Auckland Ward had 40 children, um, mostly Samoan, Tongan, and Maori. Uh, their parents were mostly working class and went to public schools. And the president was a Samoan woman um, who worked in public health and had um, postgraduate, or you know, uh, what we would call in the United States, graduate degrees. So, um, so I'd like to talk about these uh, these three different primary presentations, just to make three different kinds of points um, about um, how the relationship between these local and formal institutions and centralized formal institutions. So in the um, international branches primary presentation um, in 2013, they did all the songs that were specified in the outline. They had a very professional music leader, and she just got it all together, did all the songs. And then they had additional songs that were the music leader's choice. And um, it was, there was a script, um, but it was a little, there was a little flexibility. So for example, instead of just giving a kid a line to learn um, verbatim, they would, they would give them a blank to fill in. So you know, the little kid would come up to the podium and say, on the earth, I am grateful for dinosaurs, or and then whatever. Someone else would say, on the earth, I am grateful for you know, flowers. Um, they, there were some very good speeches in this primary presentation. One of the speakers was a 11-year-old yeah, girl who was the Hong Kong City speech champion. And she stood up at the podium and said, you know, good morning, brothers and sisters. And she just unnerving self-assurance just gave this amazing speech. Um, but what was really interesting about this presentation, um, in addition to all of these kind of official boxes that they ticked, was the size of the primary in this branch. Um, it was huge, 150 people. And because of that, it really dominated the culture of the branch. Um, and everyone in the branch had about you know, one degree of separation at the most from primary. Um, they were either, if they weren't in primary, they um, taught primary or they you know, had a primary child or something like that. So because of that, um, the primary presentation was a production in which everyone had a lot, that the, everyone had a lot of skin in that game. And um, it was a culturally significant project for, for everyone in the ward, um, showing the influence of primary as in that ward as kind of the real center of gravity for that community. Um, a man in primary presentation, there were, we did two songs from the outline. Um, the, <laughs> the president and the music leader chose these other songs because they were songs that the kids already knew. This is because the kids were very unruly, because Saturday was their day of rest from the strict Hong Kong educational disciplinary system. So they're just all over the place. And also because, because the number of people fluctuated, and people didn't come regularly, we had no institutional culture. Those informal institutions were weak. They didn't exist. Um, because we didn't have the bodies all the time. So, um, so we sang all these random songs, which were easy to sing, which they knew. I mean, look at me, you know, I'm Book of Mormon stories, and I'm, I am like a star. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that we sang one song in English. And the, uh, the Mandarin parents always love um, the primary presentation when some, a song is sung in English. Um, also, a, a feature of this um, presentation was that a lot of, we, we brought in, you know how sometimes, um, uh, let's say Donald Trump will bring in you know, extra people to cheer for him at rallies? So we brought in extra kids to this presentation to bolster the numbers and give face to the presentation. You know, face is very important in Chinese culture. And um, so we brought in all these kind of kids who usually attended the international branch. And, and, and we, but they could speak Chinese, and so we, we, we sucked them all in and conscripted them. Um, there's all this pinch hitting. The, the district president um, was playing the piano. Um, I was sitting on the stand, you know, keeping the children in place. And because of that, we had to ask a mother uh, of one of the kids to hold the sign, the, the song lyrics. And she didn't know the songs that well, so she mixed up the lyrics. <laughs> and we had to sing them out of order. <laughs> so. So this, it was very chaotic by, you know, in terms of another, you know, by the standards of another thing. But this is the, like the, what, we, what happens in this primary. 
And, um, and the English language song in particular is something I'd like to mention. It, you know, it was really important for the parents and the members of the ward to hear that because it showcases not only the children's uh, cultural achievements, but kind of the opportunities for transnational mobility. Oh, no, upward mobility in a transnational community. So my time is up. Um, let me just say the Auckland primary presentation um, was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Um, it was completely flawless. Um, everyone was wearing things. And there were five extra rehearsal sessions on three Tuesday evenings and two Saturday mornings. Okay. And I, I'll tell you later on in the questions if someone wants to ask about um, authority. And there's a reason why these songs are in the outline. So in conclusion, um, sometimes the informal institutions exemplify a Chinese proverb, which is the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. And I think Medler Mema really seems to be uh, taking this on. Um, this idea that where you are, you, Mormons do stuff. You know, They do what they do. Um, in conclusion, so yes, there's colonialism, there's patriarchy, there's all this stuff. However, at the same time, the sheer mass of Mormonism in formal institutions has significant gravity, especially at the local level. In a certain sense, Mormonism is only ever experienced at the local level. The global connections created through that centralization can be a resource for members um, uh, and central authority, which I can talk about in the comments and the questions, can support and inspire local authority and differentiation. And um, last of all, here's a video clip of beaming Latter-day Saints of different nationalities and ethnicities eating heaps of food. They're sitting together at long tables. There's a media cart in the corner of the room, which is playing general conference talks on a loop. But as you can see, most people are chatting with their neighbors, and the American-accented voice of the speaker is merely part of the happy din. This is Mormonism's global reality. Thank you.